I am. I'm going to ignore that. How are you guys doing? Doing great? Well, I think John's going to have to edit some of the stuff out. You guys have the notes back there? If history has proved uh, to be true, which it is, today is supposed to be the, the uh, least attended. Last year was the least attended the week before Christmas uh, equipping class because uh, people want to worship at home in their bed. So uh, I think we already broke the record because last time I think there was like five of us last year. There was also the final of the World Cup, so uh, that maybe had a lot to do with it. So let me pray for us. Father, you are so kind uh, to us. You are glorious in every way, and we're here to give you glory this morning and help us to, help us to this morning, um, be attentive to your word, but also help us to be active listeners. Um, for your sake, for for your sake, even for our sake, that we would uh, be worshipful in how we look at this class. In Jesus' name, Amen. Well, this morning is our last equipping class of the year, and uh, we will see you next year. Uh, and also, it's our last equipping class on the attributes of God, or number twenty-seven, attributes of God. So we did this for twenty-seven weeks. If you can believe that. Some of you are like, yes, I can believe that very much. Uh, and uh, uh, I thought about ending in a, in a Christmassy way. Uh, so we will, in some ways, end in a Christmassy way. We, we're going to talk about what is the end of, of all this study that we did about, about God, right? We, we started off, if you remember, we started um, the class... Uh, talking about why study, why do we need to study God? And then we are going to end with the glory of God. And we're going to end uh, with, you know, hopefully looking at how we can glorify God ourselves. So uh, look at your notes. The, the, uh, the Westminster uh, Catechism, which was developed in, in the 17th century to teach, especially kids, uh, how to, to teach the Bible, it was a series of question and answers the kids used to, needed to learn. And, and the first question of this uh, Westminster Catechism said, what is the chief end of man? Um, in a sense, it's like, what is the, the purpose? What is the, the, the most important uh, aim of, of man, of mankind? What is it, right? And so as a child, you learn that. Okay, so what, why, why am I alive? Right? It's, it's not, you know, uh, the philosophers were the first ones to ask themselves that, right? They said, well, why, why am I doing this? Why, why am I here? Why, why do I have to go to school? Why do I have to do what we do? And, and the Westminster Catechism said that the chief end of men was to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. Now, um, to glorify God. And then, and then they gave verses right there. You see it in front of you, right? First um, Corinthians thir- uh, 10, 31. You probably learned that as a child. If you went to Sunday school, that passage says, whether then you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all uh, to the glory of God. And, and that passage, it's not only dealing with the glory of God, it's dealing with the idea of the Lord's Supper. And they're saying, you know, whether you eat or you drink, meaning the Lord's Supper, or whatever you do, right? Whatever you do in church, that, was the, that, that is the context right there. Do it to the glory of God. Uh, then you have uh, Romans eleven thirty six, which is another passage that deals with the glory of God, a well-known passage. And then he talks about here, they talk about this idea of enjoying him forever, Right? Uh, as Psalm uh, 30, uh, 73, 25 to 28 says that, you know, the whole passage, whom I have in heaven but you, and besides you, I have nothing, desire nothing on earth. 
And then he talks about the nearness of God is our good. So the chief end of man is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. The problem, and here's the problem. The problem is that when we talk about God's glory, we run into a huge problem. We run into a huge problem. Because it is hard to know what is the glory of God. Right? What, I never forget this. I had been saved for about a year, and I was being discipled by, by this guy who, uh, at the time, I thought he was super old. Uh, he, was, he was way older than me. He was 27. <laughs> and, uh, and I remember thinking, this guy's so old. And I remember he, he said to me, I, we were talking about, I was reading a, I was reading a, uh, a book, and, um, and the book dealt with, it was called The, the Holiness of God by R.C. Sproul. And the book talked about God's glory and glorifying God. So I was telling this guy that I wanted to glorify God. And he said to me, how would you define the glory of God? And I was like, I don't know, like, the glory of God. You know what I mean? You know, when you define something and you use the word, that means you didn't define anything, right? Um, so how do you define that? Well, you see the, in, in, in the introduction letter B, what is the glory of God? Beauty versus basketball. Um, John Piper says, defining the glory of God is impossible. I say this because it is more like the word beauty than the word basketball. And I don't know if you ever read much about our, uh, John Piper, but sometimes he's tough to understand as he writes. Uh, and when he speaks, it's even worse. Uh, but he goes on to explain in this, in this sermon that, he, that, he, that he's uh, preached that if you say to someone, I'll ask you the question, what is a basketball? Do you have any basketball fans here? Really? No one likes basketball here? Oh, yeah. What is a basketball? Yeah, a basketball is round. It's big. It's big. What else? It's white. It's round and white. It's white. It's what? Light? Life. Life. Oh, bicycle. Oh, yeah. Funny. It bounces. What else? Yes, you're giving me. Yes. You used to play a game. What else? It's tangible. Very important. What, what if I showed you a soccer ball? In a basketball, would you be able to tell me? Yeah. Who doesn't know the difference between a soccer ball and a, and a basketball? Besides Taylor. <laughs> Do you, all of you know the difference? You sure? What's that? One is larger than the other. What else would you say? Yeah. yeah. Colors, right? What you use it for. One of them is if you try to kick a uh, basketball, probably hurts. If you try to kick a soccer ball, it doesn't hurt. I mean, unless you kick it wrong. Uh, so you know the difference. But if I say to you, Taylor, define the word beauty to me. <laughs> Go ahead. I'm listening since you didn't know what a basketball was. What is the word beauty? Yes, I was hoping you would say my wife next to me. <laughs> yeah. It's hard, right? You have to show something. Well, this is beauty right here. Right? But you can't. It's hard to, with your own words, to explain that word, right? Beauty. Uh, you know, wonderful. Uh, why? Because it's just something, like Bob said, it's intangible, Right? A basketball, you've seen before. You maybe played with a basketball. Uh, maybe you saw it on TV if you've never seen it live. But beauty, well, it's on the eye of the beholder, right? What you can think that maybe is beautiful, someone thinks it's boring, uh, or whatever. So uh, that is the issue when we come to the glory of God, right? When we come to the, these, especially that phrase, glory of God, or even the word glory itself, it, it can evoke different ideas to you, right? Uh, you might think, well, 
how would you say the glory of God? I don't know. Um, I've heard someone talk about radiance. I heard someone talk, to, talk about God's fame. And yes, all of that is, is part of God's glory. But look at what Herman Bavinck says in the definition there. Uh, James, do you want to read that for us? The glory of God is the splendor and brilliance that is inseparably associated with all of God's attributes and a self-revelation in nature, the glorious form in which he everywhere appears to his creatures. Okay, so well, let's, let's unpack this just a tiny bit. Uh, uh, Bavinck says here that the glory of God is the splendor. What, what does the word splendor mean? Yeah, yeah, magnificent. Something uh, like some, something having like a magnificent feature or, or grandeur, we can say, right? Or about, what about the word brilliance? Smart. Yeah, it could be smart. What else? Light. Light. Yeah, brightness, light, right? Yeah, brightness. So the glory of God is that it's that grandeur or that you know brightness that is. Uh, inseparably associated with all of God's attributes. So remember, we've go gone through many attributes of God. So all of those attributes of God show and display His glory. Even the attributes that we don't understand very well, right? Like simplicity. That shows that God is glorious. And, and that He chose to reveal Himself in that way. Last week, uh, we couldn't have asked for a, for, a better, for a better introduction to the glory of God as Chris taught on the holiness of God. And you're going to see that as I'm, I'm going to talk about God's glory, it's going to overlap some of the things he said because God is gloriously holy. But it's also going to overlap when we talk about God's omniscience and omnipotence and when we talk about God's love and we talk about his immutability, his faithfulness, and I can go on and on and on and on because God in every one of these attributes, he is glorious. He, he shows his splendor. He shows his, his brilliance. Um, it, and it appears everywhere for all the creatures to see. And we're going to see this even in the creation. Even unbelievers know the glory of God even though they might be denying who God is. MacArthur says, that's your second quote right there, says, God's glory refers to the consummate beauty of the totality of his perfections. Again, the idea of perfections. Remember, we talked about this early on. You can substitute that with attributes. Uh, it is his supreme significance and uh, splendor. I love that quote. That is such a clear Short quote, right? That, that is what it is. That, that God's beauty is found in who he is. Um, we, we're going to see that some people call this the godness of God. Uh, it sounds funny, but it is. It's what makes God God. He's glorious in everything. Um, look, at, uh, um, look at what Richard Gaffin says here. Um, let's have a lady re read this. Um, Hannah, you want to read this? Sit. Starts with God's glory. Thank you. Okay, so look at this. So we're going to talk about some of these verses. So I don't want to ruin everything, but, but look at this. It says, God's glory is visible in, uh, in, active, uh, in his active presence. And it says, his glory fills the entire creation. Remember what uh, Psalm 19.1 says? The heavens do what? Yeah, tell or declare the glory of God. This is what the heavens. Re remember, that's, that's what kind of revelation? Starts with a G. General. General revelation, right? And then you have Isaiah 6 3 that Chris talked to us about last week, which is this, 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 the seraphims say what? Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, right? No, that's, that's a him. What does he say? Holy, holy, holy. Yeah, the whole earth is full of your glory. Yeah, so 
So the earth is full of God's glory. And then Gaffin says, and he goes back to the Old Testament, how like, Israel could tangibly see God's glory because it went with them, right? We're going to see this in a pillar of cloud and in a pillar of fire. They were able to see the glory of God. Remember when, when Moses comes down from the mountain and they basically put a tarp over him. It wasn't a tarp. But why? Because his face shone because he was in front of God. So th that was part of the glory of God, that radiance of God, right? Now, when we talk about this, and I haven't done this much at all, we need to talk about the original languages. And I'm not doing this to be pedantic and to tell you, oh, look, I know these languages. But they're important because we need to see where these words are coming from in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. So in the Hebrew... As we look at the definition and try to understand this, we need to see that in the Hebrew, the word uh, glory, kabod, means weighty uh, or, or, or heavy. Um, it's also, um, there's also two other words, uh, hador and hadar, which means splendor, which means splendor. And, and um, the word uh, translated by our English word glory, kabod, which comes from the verb root meaning uh, to be heavy, uh, apparently in the, in the Hebrew's mind, uh, a person of, of importance was, was thought in this term of, uh, of weightiness. Um, too bad we don't live in that time, right, for some of us. Uh, but that's, that's kind of what they thought about. So, uh, for example, if you, if you, look at, if you start looking at uh, the Old Testament, uh, Someone find for me Genesis 31.1. Genesis 31.1. Whoever has it, reads it. Now Jacob heard the words of Laban's sons, saying, Jacob has taken all, away all that was our father's, and from what belonged to our father, he has made all this wealth. Okay, so remember the story here, right? The story is that Jacob is fleeing from his father-in-law. He had been working. Uh, he worked seven years for one uh, daughter. He got the wrong one. Then he worked seven years for the other daughter, and he got the right one, and he stayed another seven years. So he stayed 21 years working for his father-in-law, and he had enough, and he left, right? And he left with everything that belonged to him. But... Uh, Laban's son thinks, oh, he stole the, our, you know, our wealth. And look at that word over there at the end of verse 31. Uh, he has made all his wealth. You see that? I don't know what, do you have any other word besides wealth? ESV maybe, something different. NAS, NIV, nothing. Whatever other one do you use? Okay. That word wealth there is the word for glory. Uh, in a sense, Jacob's wealth uh, is called his glory. He, in, in, what it says here literally is that he was heavy with all the stuff he has. And you can understand that when someone has a lot of wealth, especially back then, there's no bank. There's no, you know, you don't transfer money between banks. I mean, he was heavy with all the stuff he owned. But also it's his glory. It's that word for kabod. It's like he was heavy with that. Uh, that, that's one word. Same thing. Look at uh, Genesis 45, 13. Forty-five, thirteen. This is the story of Joseph. He revealed himself, who he was, to his brothers here. And he deals in a very kind way with them. He forgave them for selling them to, into slavery and treated them terrible. And look what it says in um, Genesis 45, 13. If you have it, just read it. Now you must tell my father of all he has told me in Egypt and all that you have seen. And you must hurry and bring my father there. Okay, that word splendor, thank you, Hattie. That 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 word splendor that you see that you see that right there, um, it, it's it speaks of Joseph's position, right? He's this like incredible governor. Uh, but that word there is that word for, is kabod, that word for glory. In a sense, it's like saying, tell them about my glory here. 
He doesn't mean, look, I'm glorious, I'm God. He's just saying, like, look at my high position. Um, Job lo- lost all his wealth, right? Uh, and he says in Job 19.9, um, I can read this for you, that God had stripped his glory from him. Um, uh, that idea, again, of like, not his glory. What do you mean his glory? I thought it was intangible. Well, in this case, it was his wealth. It was what he was heavy with. Everything he owned, God took from him. Um, even the nobility of Israel or the honorable men of Israel uh, in Isaiah 5.13 are referred to as the nation's glory. That's how they're referred to. Um, even in Psalm uh, 49, 16 to 70, the psalmist reminds us that the wealthy man, uh, when he dies, his glory, uh, that is his wealth, uh, shall not descend after him. That's, you know, that person says, you can't take it with you when you die. Well, that, that's the idea. So based on all of this, you can see that in the Old Testament, the idea of glory meant someone who had wealth, Someone who had splendor, someone who was a nobleman, someone who uh, had exceeding, like an exceeded pos- like a position, uh, someone who just had everything really in the world. And that's when you deal with humans. But when it comes to God, things are completely different. Because, yes, it's true, God has all the wealth, He owns everything. But that's not what defines Him, right? Yes, God is just, is, is high above everything, but that's not only what defines him, right? It's, it's a collection of everything. Look at what Robert Raymond uh, says there in your notes. Uh, Kyle, you want to read that? It's the second quote uh, there in the second page. The Bible, however, mainly speaks of God's glory. When it does, it refers to what God is in his essential being and nature. This is, that is to say, God's glory is simply the inescapable weight of the sheer intrinsic godness of God, inherent in the attributes essential to him as the deity. Whoa, <laughs> there's just so much in this quote. Um, Robert Raymond, by the way, he starts his, uh, the, his whole um, section on the attributes of God in his book, in his theology book, by talking about uh, the glory of God. That's the very first things he talks about. And then he kind of explains all of the attributes of God based on the glory of God. Herman Babink, uh, if you ever, which you should read Herman Babink and get his four-volume theology, uh, he ends with the glory of God. Uh, he just says, all of these attributes, uh, come on, the glory of God, right, at the end. Um, you I mean, I don't think there's a right or wrong way to do this. Uh, we chose to do the glory of God because we can see the glory of Christmas, I guess. But, but you can do it either way. And what Raymond says here, he talks about this idea of that um, God's glory is simply his inescapable weight of the sheer intrinsic godness of God. Basically, this is what makes God God. Like, it, it's almost impossible for us to understand this. The fact is the glory of God is so hard for us to define because it is what makes God who God is. That's it. That's the key to it. And this is why we have a hard time even understanding that because we said that in the very first attribute we looked at, those of you that were with me uh, eight months ago or nine months ago, whenever that was, do you remember what was the first attribute we looked at after looking at why study theology? I remember it made such an impact in your lives. Remember? It was the incomprehensibility of God. We can't understand God perfectly, right? We can't. And we end with the incomprehensibility of God. This is what makes God, God, uh, completely different. Look at Exodus 33, 19, that story that I think we quoted every single one of these 27 weeks together. That story of Moses, you should know it by memory, after uh, Israel sins with the golden calf and God is going to destroy Israel. Then uh, Moses said, no. Then Moses says, destroy them. You know, and then God says, no. And they, you know, they go around and around. And then Moses asked God to see his glory. Show me your glory. 
And he's asking him, show me your, your kavod. I, I want to see. I just want to see you. I, I, I don't think he wants to see miracles. He's seen enough miracles. He wanted to see that godness of God. That's what he wanted to see. He wanted to go behind the curtain, if you will, and see, okay, so just display yourself to me. Show me who you are. And that's what, that's what I think makes Moses such a hero, is that he's seen what God was capable of. Uh, he saw the ten plagues. I mean, his whole life was lived, you know, being persecuted. You know, even before, before he was born, he was being persecuted. And now when he is over 80 years old, he's telling God, God, I want to see you. Like, show me who you are. I want to see you. Even in Psalm 19.1, we talked about this, right? The heavens declare the glory, that kabod of, of God. The, the, the heavens declare the godness of God. Even an unbeliever can see the world and know that something is something special. Yeah, they will, they're going to attribute it to something else because they, they would have to bend the knee to this God that created everything. But the heavens are revealing that general revelation shows that God is God. Even Isaiah 6.3, as we saw before, right? The, the seraphim are, are crying out, holy, 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 the whole earth is full of your glory, of your kabod. And you think about this, you know, when you read the Old Testament over and over again, it's hard to wrap your mind around the fact that God is a God that is glorious. But it is constantly mentioned, right? That God is glorious, that this is who God is. He's a God of splendor. Um, this is who God is. And you notice that this is, I think, what makes the Bible such an amazing book. It never tries to define God. It never tries to say, well, you see, you need to understand that God is a being. Like, because if you try to define God, again, like we said, not only would you fry your brain, but you're, you're, you won't be able to understand them. And in the Old Testament, if you read, especially you go through the Psalms, um, I, I dare you to do this. Just pick two Psalms. You know, they talk about the glory of God. You're going to see that th this idea of that he's glorious and who he is, what he does, uh, especially in salvation, uh, how he deals with people, even with, with the animal kingdom, God is glorious. He's glorious in every way. And everyone sees this. This is why when you have, you know, civilizations, ancient civilizations, they had... Uh, gods that they, they made, right? They made these idols. Uh, they always had these glorious idols. They had this way to explain how, how the world came about. You even look at the civilizations back of the Tigers and Euphrates, right? The Sumerians. They had their own story. They needed to figure out how this happened. They needed to figure out how the world came around and how they can wash away their sins, wash away the things that they shouldn't do. That's why they had human sacrifices. That have the, that's why they thought that it was a direct correlation to the fact that they didn't have rain. Oh, I've done, I must have done something. So let's bring, you know, whatever, 20 virgins and offer them to, you know, uh, throw them in the volcano. Maybe we'll get some rain now. Right? You, you see that? Why do they think that happens? It's because inside their heart, they know there's something bigger than they are. And that's that glory of God. That is the glory of God that... They try to see, they see on creation, then they can't explain. There's no way to explain this. So now that's the, the Old Testament. But then in the Greek, in the New Testament, there is the word doxa. And that sounds like a word you know, right? What is a word? Doxology, doxology right? Doxology. And, and the word doxa uh, for glory it's also, it means appearance, it could mean uh, form, prestige, splendor, luster, uh, or the glory of a person or, or matter. And, and, and look at this, there, there are verses that you know really well that I quoted for you there. And I, I only, I mean, we could be here, seriously, I, I say this often, I mean it every time, but, but I even mean it more today than ever. We could be here five hours talking about this. Verses in the New Testament that deal with the glory of God. I picked two, um, uh, a positive and a negative one, <laughs> in a sense. 
Uh, look at the negative one first. Romans 3.23 that we learn always in Sunday school. I remember learning that pretty much every year. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Now, this verse, we usually give it, I mean, and rightly so, it, we share this with unbelievers, right? All have sinned. Sin is, and we talked about this when we did homartiology, all of us have sinned, and we fall short of the glory of God. We forget the glory of God. We talk about the fall short, meaning we don't meet God's standard. But what does it say here? All have sinned, and fall short of what? The glory of God, using the word doxa there. Now, what is the glory of God here? I'll wait for your answers while I sip on my coffee. Righteousness, Righteousness perfection, yes. What else? Holiness. Holiness, whoever said that. Yes. What else? I'm looking for a phrase in particular that I said already. <laughs> Go to the tape. See, tape was this thing now. See, the glory of God here speaks of God's righteous standard. That is God's glory. Have you thought about that? That God's glory is his righteous standard? We think more that that's like his justice, right? And it's true. But his justice is his glory. Every one of his attributes is, is his glory. So in a sense, Romans 3.23 is saying here that all have sinned, horrible news, and fall short of the fact that God shows his glory by showing his righteous standard. If he wasn't righteous, then he doesn't have any glory. He ceases to be God, and he doesn't have glory. Um, look at Romans 6, 4. Uh, Christ was raised from the dead, that should be said through, uh, through the glory of the Father. Again, this speaks of the, the, power, the, the power and the love and the faithfulness of God to his Son. That is the glory of God. The power, the love, and the faithfulness. Did we talk about the power of God? John did, remember? A few months ago. Did we talk about the love of God? Yes, we did. The faithfulness of God? Yes, we did. Those are three attributes of God that are being shown just in this verse alone. And we keep can keep going on and on and on with verses that have even the, the word doxa, glory, that reveal who Christ or who God is in the New Testament, like in the Old Testament. Now, how is the glory of God displayed? And that is the next section I want to I share with you. And I got to pick up the pace. Uh, the glory of God is uh, displayed first in creation. Right? Genesis 1. If you, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use this in, in, for effect. When you open Genesis 1, you are punched with the idea that the world didn't just come about by itself. Right? You're shown immediately that in the beginning, God created. So you're looking at someone who in the beginning of everything created everything the heavens and the earth. And then subsequently he uses six literal days to create the rest of, of, of the world. It's incredible. If that's not glorious, what is, right? This is what you have to contend with. You show up to the Bible and you say, I want to start reading the Bible, January 1st, Genesis 1. You are assaulted with the idea that God is glorious because he is the creator, Right? Um, Psalm 19, again, right? Psalm 19, 1 and 2. The heavens declare of the glory of God. God's glory is seen in his creation. The heavens are shouting constantly that God is the creator, that God is glorious in every way. Look with me to Romans 1. Romans 1.
to someone to read verse 20 only. We're not going to read all the verses, but just verse 20. Yeah, okay, so remember what verse 18. So Paul starts writing Romans. You should be, if you were here for Romans, for the whole Rome, book of Romans, um, have any of you been, were, were you, any of you here for the whole book of Romans? I'm not, oh wow, quite a few of you, okay. So I wasn't here, but I'm assuming that John explained verses 1 through uh, 18, or 17, and then he got through 18, and he talked about the wrath of God. And he's talking about the wrath of God and unbelief. All these people are suppressing the truth. And then in verse 19, he talks about that God made them evident to them, all these things, right? And then he goes to the creation of the world, right? And then he says, for, for since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power, and his divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through uh, what has been made, so that they are without excuse. Meaning that the glory of God shown in creation is what indicts the sinner. Have you ever thought about that? Like, even if someone never heard the gospel, you know, you hear those people saying, well, how come, you know, you know what about those people that never heard the gospel? Are they going to be in heaven with me? Because at least they can get a chance there. What would you say? I'll tell you what you should say. No, they haven't repented. But they know there's a God, right? How do they know there's a God? It's just like the ancients knew there was a God that created everything, so they had all these crazy creation stories. Why? Because they saw the invisible attributes of God. They saw, look at a tree. I'm not very good at biology, but I can tell you that a tree is pretty amazing. But look at the, at the human body. It's incredible. Look at the stars, the moon. I mean, they could see a lot more stars than we can now, back then. Look at the seasons, how things change, right? Uh, not so much in Southern California, but just imagine there were seasons here, right? I mean, all these things, God made this. So they know there's something. And he says here, there's, they have no excuse. They have no excuse. So first of all, you see here the glory of God displayed in creation, but also the glory of, of God is displayed in mankind. Genesis 1, chapter 1 and 2, chapter 2, you see that God created mankind at the very end of creation. As the crowning achievement of creation, he creates man, and then he creates the woman. That's the crowning achievement, and you might say, well, that's impossible. I mean, my dog is better than 90% of the people, right? Uh, maybe so, but, uh, but God created. That is his crowning achievement was creating man. That, that is what Psalm 8 says. Go with me to Psalm 8. Someone read Psalm 8, verses 3 to 5. Yeah, thank you. Do you see that? God, like, you look at heaven and you're thinking, oh, man, this is incredible. And, and then you think... The, the psalmist here, David, he's saying here, like, what is man? That you, like, you look at the world. It's incredible. What is man? And then he says, yet you made man a little lower than God and, or, or a heavenly being. Uh, it depends what version you have. And it says here that you crown man with glory and majesty. So humankind, actually, if you can believe this, it's crowned with glory by God. Now, you might not feel right now like you're being crowned with glory, but you are. You, God created you, and God's glory is displayed in human beings. 
Uh, by the way, as a side note, this is why it's, it's so important to understand the right to life, right? Because not only are they the image of God, you know, this is so important for us to understand, understand that this is the glory of God in mankind. God's glory is shown in people like you and me. Also, the glory of God is displayed in the glory of God in, in Scripture. In Scripture. And I have a ton here, so we, we're not going to go uh, through, any, through most of this stuff. But um, you have it in your notes. And I wrote this on purpose because I want you to, to look through it uh, and look at it. But it, it's incredible as you look through Scripture to see how the, God is not shy of showing his glory to his creatures. Uh, look at the, if you look at the, the, the Exodus and what, how, what God did, how he performed miracles, how his presence was with him, and, and the pillar of fire and the cloud. I mean, God didn't need to do that. God didn't need to show them their, his glory in a pillar of fire by night and the cloud. But it's like God created this huge night light for them to, to see, oh, that it's the glory with us. And that cloud, that's the glory with us. I mean, it's incredible to think about that. Even the glory of God in the Sabbath, as uh, we were talking with Chris last week, how it's revealed uh, to Moses and how God lets his goodness pass uh, through him. Um, even how the psalmist talks about the, the glory of God is above the heavens. It's incredible to look at this, um, even as you look at visions. Uh, it's incredible to see how the glory of God, God always have wanted to share who he is with people. That, that was what he wanted. That was what God wanted. Um, and, and it's incredible to think about this. Uh, Piper says, the glory of God is manifest beauty of his holiness it is the going public of his holiness. And that's what you see in Scripture. If you read the Old Testament, um, this year, this next year, 2024, read the Old Testament. And look at every time the psalmist, uh, Moses, uh, the, hist the historical writers, the writing about the prophets, the minor prophets, they're writing about the glory of God. I mean, I mean, you'll go through many pens trying to like start next to every time it says that. Why? Because God is trying to, as, as Piper is saying here, he, this is the going public of his holiness. This is how he manifests who he is to people. He's not shy of doing that. He shows himself constantly. He's revealing himself who he is. So when Moses says, show me your glory, I thought it, I was like, oh man, I can't believe Moses asked that. Well, he wanted to see who God was. He wanted to see who is this person who he's been talking to. And he had seen God's glory. Remember when in the burning bush? That was part of God's glory. Uh, remember all the miracles he already witnessed in the ten plagues? That, that's God's glory in judgment. Uh, how about when he drowned all the Egyptians? How about when they give him water and meat and the manna? Oh, you can keep going on and on, right? God constantly was showing his glory to them. Now, I chose a couple of passages on the glory of God there. Um, one of them is the doxologies. Uh, there are uh, seven uh, doxologies. Um, but one of them is uh, 1 Chronicles 29. 1 Chronicles 29. So I want you to go with me to 1 Chronicles 29. This is at the end of um, David's life. Um, he, remember in, verse, in chapter 28, they, um, they were gathering uh, money uh, to build the temple. So much so that they just said, hey, <laughs> don't bring us any more. Like, we, we're good. We're, we have more than we need. And then in chapter uh, 29... David is at the end of his life. And 
um, you, you, you get the sense his, his son is about to be crowned uh, king. Uh, they were co-regents for a very short time together. Uh, and look what he says in verses 11 and 12. Whoever has it can read it. First Chronicles 29, 11 and 12. Well, what a better way to die than to pray this, right? Like to, after David had seen everything um, right before he dies, he prays this. Um, notice what he's talking about. He's not only talking about this idea of like God is the owner of everything. He says God is the owner of glory. <laughs> that, that weightiness, this is God. That majesty, this is who God is. That splendor, this is who God is. Uh, everything in heaven, everything belongs to him because that is who he is. We lose sight when you read, read a prayer like this and we just think, oh man, that's a great song. I've, you've, you've heard songs, no doubt about this, this verse. But yes, it is a great song. But what he's saying here, he's talking about God's glory, that weightiness of who God is. Even Paul in the doxologies as there's plenty of doxologists to go around, right, that he writes. Uh, but let's just go to one. Let's go to uh, Romans 11, 36. I frankly could have picked any of this, but... Anyone can read it. Well, great, right? Do you remember what the first 11 chapters of Romans was about? The mercies of God, right? The whole work of salvation, you can say. Uh, and then Paul can't contain himself, and he ends with that, one of the most amazing uh, doxologies that start uh, in verse 33 and ends in 36, saying, finally, for, from him, through him, uh, and to him are all things, to him be the glory, right? This is similar to seven doxologies of, of Paul's uh, letters. And all of them say the same thing. Glory needs to be given to God. All glory needs to be given to God. Now, doesn't God already have the glory? <laughs> we'll be thinking about that because that's going to come back in maybe five minutes from now. Well, I couldn't leave this alone. I wanted to be Christmassy about this. So in the case study, we're going to look at the glory of God in Jesus Christ. And we don't have a lot of time to look at this, but I just want you to, and I wrote it down, thankfully, for you to, to have and to take with you and maybe go through this during, your, the, you know, during the Christmas day or the day before Christmas. But look at how the glory of God it's linked in the incarnation of God. Um, Hebrew, Hebrews 1, 3 tells us that, that, the, that Jesus, uh, let me read it for you. Uh, look at what Hebrews 1, 3 says, that Jesus is the radiance of the glory of God. Uh, he's the exact representation of his nature and upholds all things by the power of his word. That's what Jesus says. Uh, uh, even in the birth narratives, right? You have in Luke 2, this idea that the glory of God is going to come. The, the, the angels, when they're singing to the shepherds, what do they sing? Glory to God in the highest, right? Uh, uh, in the miracles, right? Why was Jesus doing miracles? John 2 tells us that he was showing his glory to, for people to believe. That's what John says. When he's at the wedding in Cana, uh, in the transfiguration, Jesus peeled himself, you know, like the, his body, if you can say, and showed them his glory. Even as he's suffering in the crucifixion, he's showing his glory. Look at those verses. Even in his exaltation, in his resurrection and exaltation, God shows his glory. He shows it in his ascension. 
and at his coming, uh, victory and judgment. That's showing that God in Jesus deserves all the glory. This isn't, Jesus is not God Jr. who gets a little less glory, right? He gets the same glory. Um, that is what he says in the high priestly prayer, right? Do you remember in the high priestly prayer in John 17, he's praying and he's saying, God, Father, you need to give me the glory that was mine. And that sounds like, kind of like, that sounds kind of like the prodigal son a little bit. Just give me what's mine or what's coming to me. He's not doing that. He's just saying, I want to, you to give me the glory so you, you are glorified. That's what he says. So the glory of Christ actually glorifies the Father. And in Christmas, if you think about this, that is what Christmas is all about. Yes, don't get me wrong. Get together, have good food, have gifts, enjoy the day. But really, it is to see the glory of God in Jesus, right? Uh, completely. Now, what are the implications of this? Well, the first one is worshiping the God of glory. Um, as you come face to face with, the, with God's glory, we're coming face to face before the glory of Christ. Our hearts have seen the weightiness of who God is and how profoundly needy we are before God. I mean, I don't know about you, but if you look at the glory of God, you, you see that you are not as glorious as you thought you were, right? Um, no one here would say we're glorious, but we act like we're glorious uh, when given the chance. But the idea of worshiping God, that is, should be the first thing we think about. As we look at God's glory, that should, that what should come out of our hearts is, am I worshiping God, the God of glory? Is this an opportunity that I have to worship Him, to give Him all my singing, all my life, everything that belongs to him. Do I think about God being a God of glory? How does the glory of God change how I think about my life, my, the decisions I make? And that leads us to the second one, which is to live for God's glory. Live for God's glory. Again, it, it, it's how we started off uh, half of you weren't here, but we talked about this idea of like, when someone says to you, what is the glory of God? You, don't, you might not know, right? You might think, well, I don't know. It's kind of like describing the word beauty, right? Um, but so we use that constantly, that phrase that has become this Christian moniker. I want to live for God's glory. So the question would be, so how? How do we live for God's glory? And I remember hearing uh, Piper years ago talk about this. And he says, the first thing you got to do when you want to live for God's glory is, uh, I think he called it, refuse to believe you deserve any glory. I'm, I'm paraphrasing. It was a long time ago. But it's the first thing you got to do is refuse to believe you deserve any glory. And really, if I was to ask you, do you deserve any glory? No one here is going to say, absolutely, I deserve glory. No, you would say, no, of course not. But do you act, or do I act? I know I do. How many times I act like I deserve glory in the ways I speak to my kids or my wife or the ways, or what I think when I drive or other things, right? We act like we deserve glory. And Piper's right. The first thing you have to do is to refuse to believe you deserve glory. But then he had a positive one, too, and I'm, I guess I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm paraphrasing, but he, he said something like along the lines of, like, turn to Christ. Turn to Christ. So as you're refusing to receive the glory that you think you're due, what you do is you turn to Christ. And you said, you're the one that deserves all the glory, not me. Like, I, don't, I, I know what I, what's going through right now. I'm going through right now. It seems like it's unfair, but you were the one that was treated unfair. And you can just... Fill, fill in the blank with whatever's going on in your life. You th I know I think I should do this, but you, Christ, are the one who deserves all the glory. A and that changes everything, how you think. 
It, it does. It, it thinks how you think. And that's how you give glory to God. And there's a myriad of ways of living for, for the Lord and not living for ourselves, not living thinking that today is, you know, kind of we live like unbelievers, let's, you know, eat and be merry for tomorrow we die. Uh, but really to live thinking and having that eternal uh, perspective. Um, look at that quote, this quote here by this commentator, uh, Cruz. Um, John, you're familiar with Cruz, right? Why don't you read that for us? And it's true, right? I mean, all of these things, you see this, and you can even translate that to today with us, right? How are we giving God glory? Are you giving God glory for things that are happening? And I think it's easy for us to say, well, you know, you know to God be the glory, you know, for anything. But do you really mean that when you say that? <laughs> or is it just that Christian moniker that has become, you know, that cliche that we say, you know, and, well, just give God the glory. Uh, truly, do you mean that? It's like every time I look, I, I hear an athlete, you know, got, got four touchdowns and has 250 yards, uh, you know, of receiving yards. And they say, first of all, I want to thank my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You know, they say that. And then they proceed to, like, talk about themselves. Uh, it sounds a little hollow after that. You're just thinking, like, eh. You talked about Jesus, but then now you're just saying, I knew we were going to win. These people, they're nothing without, you know. Uh, okay, uh, so which is it? Um, uh, but we can be like that too. I mean, it sounds ridiculous on, on TV, but we say it in our own hearts. We say it out, uh, you know, we say out loud, Jesus is all the glory, and they're thinking, hey, how come I, I don't get what it, what's coming to me? Uh, and I think that, that this is why I wanted to end with the glory of God. Because once you come, have come face to face with who God is for 27 weeks, if we were here for all of them, or 26 weeks, if you weren't here for all of them, or less, uh, you can't help but just say, you know what, God, you deserve all the glory. You deserve all the worship. I don't deserve anything that I think is coming to me. I thought about what song to choose, and I thought of, of a Christmas carol um, that deals uh, with the, the glory of God. Um, and it's funny because this song is, we sing it every year, uh, you probably hear it about 150 times a year, all in the month of December, or at home. We start in July, so we hear a little, little old, you know, more than that. Uh, Christmas in July, Melissa? Yes. Uh, but um, uh, it's a fantastic song. Um, and um, it's, yeah, it's my, one of my favorites, too. Um, so... Um, Katie, do you want to read this for us? I chose this song because it's such a simple song, but really it bo it boils the the whole you know Jesus birth, his birth story in, in in such a short and concise way. But this idea that Jesus is laying in a manger as a baby and yet he is God, who deserves all the glory, who is having angels singing. Uh, it, it's incredible to think about that, right? There's such uh, a feeble baby 
uh, it's actually God <laughs> right there. He didn't take on God later. You know, it was God who took on that feeble baby so that he could be uh, like us and could die and even receive glory as he dies and rises again and is now exalted in heaven. So let's pray. Father, we are amazed to see um, who you are. And in this Christmas season, we do want to give you all the glory. We don't want to just make that as a uh, Christian cliche that we say and we don't mean, but we truly want to give you all the glory uh, because you are worthy uh, of our praise. You are worthy of our lives. You are worthy of everything. So help us, even today, as we go through life and we lose perspective, to not lose perspective that you are the glorious God that deserves our loyalty and our praise forever. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.